teach me what Greg cannot. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we are going to be in Colossians chapter 2 and chapter 3. We've been talking um, a great deal about how much of, of church is actually influenced by the world and by society rather than by Jesus. And Jesus, uh, the ideas that he had for church um, was more about when two or three are together, I'll be right there having church with you. And that's what Jesus thought church would be like. And so... Uh, as man gets a hold of it, um, we fall to the, our own desires and our own thoughts and our own opinions and we start to create church and uh, make church look like something entirely different. And, uh, and, you know, just like us humans do with a lot of things, we mess stuff up, don't we? And so we want to get back to church and we want to uh, be the kind of church that that Jesus wanted and the kind of church that Jesus established and there's just so many things that we look at church and we go wow where'd that come from right why do we do it like that and it has nothing to do with Jesus it has everything to do with society and man making their own rules and adding their own stuff to it and uh, as we look at the Apostle Paul, one of the things that we see Paul did throughout his letters was trying to fix that and trying to stop that. And how many of you know that Jesus died to give us a new deal, didn't he? And this new deal that he gave us was grace, and it was amazing, and it was an incredible deal. You guys ever got a really good deal? Yeah, some of you got a really good deal on something. And we get more excited about that deal than we do about the one that Jesus gave us. And we get good deals and we are high-fiving each other over good deals and we love good deals and good deals are great, aren't they? How many of you would see a great deal and know that it's a great deal and go, you know what, I'll just pay full price. <laughs> that would be stupid, wouldn't it? That would be dumb to do something like that. And yet, that's what the Apostle Paul spent his entire life fighting. Is that God would offer us this incredible deal, and we go, you know what, I think I'll just take the hard road. I think I'll just go through works and religion and I'll beat myself up and I'll just have this terrible life and Christianity will be incredibly hard and I'll fail all the time. I'll just choose that. And there was a way better option, a way easier path. And so when man gets a hold of church, we want to make it harder for other people for some reason because the deal is so good that we get upset and we say, no, the deal can't be that good. So we're going to add a bunch of burdens and bondage to it that we want to put you under the yoke of that. And you need to suffer with this burden and this yoke of bondage. Listen, there's enough suffering in just following Jesus alone. We don't need to add burdens to it. We don't need to add bondages to it. And so, uh, ultimately, the Apostle Paul spent a, a great deal of his ministry fighting off people who were trying to make this deal worse. And taking this wonderful, incredible uh, gift that God had given us, and people wanted to make it worse. So here we are in Colossians chapter 2. And we'll start in verse 4. Now I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. How many of you know that we can receive Jesus and then not walk in him? Can't we? We can receive the Lord Jesus and then not walk in Him. If we couldn't, why would Paul admonish us to walk in Him? 
rooted and built up in him, have, having been established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. This is what Paul is identifying here. He says, don't let people cheat you out of church. Don't let people cheat you out of what a deal this is. God is offering you an incredible deal and you're, and you're through the persuasiveness of words, you're going to allow it to be cheated out of your life. And the average Christian will spend most of his Christianity feeling defeated and as though he's lost. And that he has failed at his Christianity. And full of guilt and shame. Cheated out of a great deal. Just for the traditions of men. For in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Do you know that just the deal with Jesus is more than enough? He says this deal that you have with Jesus in Christ, you are complete. You don't need to add stuff to this. You're complete in Christ. The deal that Jesus offered you is complete. When Jesus said, hey, how about this deal? I'll give my life for yours. You just put your trust in me. Paul is saying you don't have to add stuff to that. You don't have to, you don't have to add all the, the, the old rules. You don't have to add any new rules. You don't have to add a bunch of stuff to that. You are complete in Christ. So one of the, one of the uh, things that was happening at that time is they were telling these Christians, well, look, yeah, that's great that you follow Jesus and, and you, can, you can be a part of this. Uh, uh, you can be a part of our Father God, um, but you still have to be circumcised. Because you're, you're still lacking. And then they would also say, and, and by the way, you also have to honor the Sabbath. Oh, and by the way, you also have to... You have to celebrate these festivals because this is what we've been doing for thousands of years. And Paul says, they're cheating you. They're cheating you. You see, because here's what religion and man's religion wants to do. They want to take you out of this mode of feeling righteous and put you into a mold of feeling guilty. Hmm. How much of our Christianity do we feel guilty we're being cheated. In him, you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by the putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. You were buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead and being dead in your trespasses. And the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him and has forgiven you of all of your trespasses. Having wiped, the, uh, wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. There was this, he, he just kind of throws out their powers and principalities. And that Jesus made this open show of these powers and principalities through his resurrection. And here's the powers and principalities, is that there are, uh, there are invisible forces for, uh, that are around us that, are, uh, that can be bad. We know that, right? And there are these powers and these principalities. And there was a handwriting of requirements. And they owned the rights to the people in their regions because of their wickedness. Did you know that? That even when you're a sinner, you're not really doing all the things that you want. 
you're doing what somebody else wants you to do. Because they own you. And they had this stronghold over people in regions because they owned them. These powers and principalities, they kept these handwriting of requirements and said, Oh, look here, your law says this, and they've broken the law. Therefore, they don't belong to you. They belong to us. And there was this handwriting of requirements. And they had fallen in love with this handwriting of requirements because they can hold it over people all the time and make them feel guilty and ashamed. And they owned them until Jesus came. And Jesus came and he walked up and he took that paper and went, I'll take that. And he nailed it to the cross. And there was a changing of ownership. And Jesus owned us, purchased us with his blood. And he made a fool out of all of those powers and principality. He disarmed them. He took what, what arm and ammunition they had, and he just walked up and slapped it out of their hands. And we choose to give it back. We let them have it back. And the truth is, is that they're powerless against us. So let no one judge you in food or drink regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are only shadows of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and the worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase that is from God. And I tell you, what, what was happening here is that they were, uh, religion was adding all these different rules and, and making a bunch of different stuff up. And, you know, as we've talked about for the past couple of weeks, most of that stuff was there to prop men up and make the worship uh, about the preacher instead of God, which is why we had fancy titles for all of them. And those are things we've talked about. Jesus said, don't do it. And the church said, eh, let's do it. Don't don't call them fathers and rabbis and pastors and bishops. And we go, eh, why not? Well, you know what? Let's go back to the old deal. Let's just take the old deal, even though Jesus is offering us a new deal. And whoa. What's happening here is, is what we see here is that these people had begun to uh, have this false humility. How many of you know that Jesus wants us to be humble, doesn't he? He demonstrated humility in incredible ways. And humility is incredibly important to us, isn't it? Without humility, we could not find the answers of truth that are in Scripture. Humility unlocks all of, the other, uh, all of the other fruits of the Spirit for us. It unlocks everything for us. It unlocks the story of Jesus to us. Without humility, we can't see stuff. And so humility is incredibly important. But there's also something called false humility. Right? And so uh, how many of you guys have ever seen people trying to be humble but weren't being humble? There's false humility. This is, listen to how humble I am. Right? When you hear stuff like that, you're like, oh, that's not it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's not it. Well, you guys know how humble I am. And here's what was happening. This is the false humility that was happening. And it talks about the worship of angels. And some of that stuff's kind of confusing because we don't really know what that's about. But here's what was happening. Some people were saying, we're so humble and these are, these are other worldly philosophies that were creeping into the church, which, by the way, is what we continue to fight to this day, these worldly philosophies that creep into the church. And their, their philosophy was that we're so not worthy to actually communicate with God that we are not worthy to worship God. We are so humble that we'll only worship the angels and they can take our worship to God. 
Boy, that sounds humble, doesn't it? But it's a false humility. It's a humility that is against God. Because what we're saying is, Jesus, I know you did an incredible work, but listen to the work I'm going to do. It's even more humble than yours. And the, the, the theory behind it was that I'm not worthy to be in God's presence. And I'm not worthy to speak to God. And how much of our Christianity do we have that same feeling? You're being cheated through vain philosophies and outside forces that creep into the church. It doesn't belong. Listen, I, I, I love the fact that this is, you know, this is one of the, the things that's, uh, that's been so freeing for me. I love the fact that I had this life and it was, a, it was a good life and God had given me a whole bunch of stuff and I destroyed all of it. Made a mess out of every bit of it. Messed it up to where I couldn't fix it. And I realized I needed God. And I messed it up so bad that he said, all right, now we can start. Now we can start. You, you weren't ready. You, you were too put together. You, you, you thought you had all this stuff figured out. And now you've realized what a mess you can make of stuff. You realize what you can do in your own power. But it's when we destroy our lives like that, we begin to realize how big God's grace is. Man, we were singing that song today, and, 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 and it says that galaxies were created from his breath. Just He breathes it out, and here comes the galaxy. Whatever picture you have of God, it's not big enough. Whatever picture you have of him, it's definitely not big enough. And so, I'm having to own that I'm not a good guy. And because I can own that, Jesus says this, this is the deal. If you own every bit of it, if you'll own 100% of it. Do you know what, what's really difficult about that? Do you know what's really hard to own 100% of stuff? Is because when you do something wrong, it makes me feel right. And then my righteousness comes from you being wrong. And that's not righteousness. Because we think if there's a wrong, then there has to be a counter to it that's right. And so every time we get into an argument, you're wrong and I'm right. All you have to do is one wrong thing and then it justifies me to behave however I want. Because you've done a wrong and you've now made me right. And what I needed in my life was to stop acknowledging the wrongs around me and own the one that's in me. And that's hard to do. It's hard to take your wrongs and set them aside and go, dude, that's your thing. Because your wrongs don't justify mine. When they do, that's your righteousness, not his. And let me tell you something, that is not a good deal. You are being cheated. You're... I, I can assure you that whoever's done stuff to you, it was wrong. But it has nothing to do with what you've done wrong. The two things are unrelated. And I had to come to these conclusions of owning my own stuff. And it was at my worst when I realized, and, and I tell you what, <laughs> It's interesting because, you know, uh, remembering my father, you know, the, 
it's been a, a decade since his passing or more and the farther away from time it gets the better of a guy he was to me <laughs> does that happen with anybody else right it's like oh no he was awesome all the time and that's cool that's great but if i'm to be honest about myself the 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 moment that i realized i was a bad guy to now i'm realizing i didn't even know how bad i was because i was still blaming like the work the uh, however bad i thought i was 10 years ago pales in comparison to what i've realized today i mean the, the knowledge and the depths of my own depravity are being realized all the time and here's what's so amazing and wonderful and what i love about this deal is that the more wicked i realized that i was the more righteous I know that I am. And I know it bothers people to see someone who's this wicked and depraved walk in 100% clean righteousness. What is it like to walk without guilt and shame? I mean, it is just freeing. It is a, a lighter load. There's a pep in your step. You don't carry the weight of that stuff. But I'm telling you, there are philosophies out there that want to cheat you from that and want you to carry burdens that you weren't meant to carry. Let's skip to chapter 3, verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, you should seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil, uh, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. And because of these things, the wrath of God has come upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked in when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all of these anger. Anybody ever been angry? No, I mean like angry. Like you're pretty sure the Incredible Hulk was about to come out and smash some stuff. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> Man, anybody ever have a dad that got super mad? Yeah, and then you became a dad that got super mad? <laughs> oh, but you are to put off anger. And most of us have graduated anger into wrath. <laughs> right? Wrath is when you start throwing stuff. Malice. Blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. And do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds. I go through this list about covetousness and anger and, and uh, all of these evil desires. And um, you, you hear this list, covetousness. If you don't know what covetousness is, it's that uh, when you get a plate and you're ungrateful with that plate and you keep demanding for more. Covetousness is the desire to keep having more and more and more. I want a raise, I get the raise, I immediately want another raise. I'm happy for three weeks or three months, but now I want something better. I want more, I want more, I want more. I need a new phone, I need a new fridge, I need a new house, I need a new car. I always want more. And you can justify and say, well, I don't always want more. It's just like once every six months or a year or something. But that's what covetousness is. And so we hear a list like this, and we hear all of these things, and what do we immediately do when we hear a list like this? Because I'm pretty sure that I'm in pretty uh, good company here as we hear this list that we've violated some of these, haven't we? Maybe today or this week we violated some of these. And so as we hear this list, how do we feel? How do we feel? Come on, come on, come on. How do we feel when we hear this list? Guilty. Guilty. 
and ashamed, concerned. <laughs> Anybody feel like a failure? You're being robbed. You're being robbed. Because you hear these other philosophies. You hear this list. And you're not actually hearing what Paul is saying, and you're not hearing what the Spirit is saying. You're hearing what these philosophies have been flooding our churches with. Guilt and shame. And you hear this list, and man, this list, it makes us feel terrible. You have put off the old man with his deeds. And we look at that and go, no, I haven't. And have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created, who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, Barbarian, Scythian, slave, nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also you must do. But above all of these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And we hear this list, and how do we feel? Guiltier. Then we're being robbed. Because here's what the Spirit is saying. What I want for you is to walk in love. And what I want for you is to put on peace. And what I want for you is to put on perfection. I want you to put on grace. And I want you to put on mercy. And I want you to put on joy. And this is what my heart's desire for you is to put on forgiveness. That's what I want you to wear. And that's what I want you to produce. And we look at things and go, this is what I'm, what I can't do, and this is what I should do. This is the stuff I can't do, and this is the stuff I should do. And Paul says, when I look at things as this is what I can't do, and this is what I should do, this ends up being the stuff that I do. And this stuff ends up being the stuff that I forget all about. And then I feel worthless and garbage, and I feel like a terrible Christian and a failure, and I'm full of guilt and shame. So come follow me to church. Because we're being robbed. Because it's not about, here's the things that you shouldn't do, and here's the things that you should do. Here's what God's saying. This is what I want for you. And it's really awesome, and it's really amazing. Because when you can walk in love, it feels great. When you can forgive someone, it feels incredible. When you can have a marriage that's full of peace, that is amazing. How many of you guys love to fight and argue with your family? It's, it, it feels terrible, doesn't it? It's, it, it? It makes us feel burdened, and it makes us feel dirty, and it makes us feel terrible. 
And the very thing that we're trying to avoid is the stuff we end up doing because we're not supposed to do it. And we know there's these rules that said we shouldn't do it. And we do it. And what God is saying is, what I want for you is to walk in peace and to walk in joy and forgiveness and long-suffering. I want you to feel the, the rush and the joy that comes with forgiving people. I want you to feel the rush and the joy that comes from living a full life in a family that has peace. I want you to feel what it's like to be forgiven and to be able to forgive. That's what I want for you. I want you to experience those things. And for you to experience those things, I just need you to put them on. However, the, the thing about it is, is before you do that, if you want to wear those, you need to take the old ones off. And the old ones are the other stuff that he was talking about of unforgiveness and um, hatred and anger and wrath. Because how many of you know that when you're really angry, you can't just put joy on over it? You can't. You can't just go, ah, let's put on joy, brother. <laughs> you can't, when, you know, when it, when it says uh, to take off the, the, uh, the, the rude talking and all of that, um, that's not there to make you feel guilty for talking rude. That is a helpful hint for you to have peace in your house. That's God going, hey, if you want to experience this incredible thing called peace in your home, maybe you shouldn't call people these names. Because if you can take this off, then you can put peace on, and that is a way better way to live life. And so when I go through life now, and I don't do that, I come over here and I do the stupid stuff that I'm not supposed to do, and then I end up go, having chaos in my house, I don't go, oh man, I'm a terrible Christian. What I say is, I should have wore something else. Thank God I'm redeemed. I should have wore something else. Next time, I know not to wear this. This is the results I'm getting from the stuff that I'm wearing. I need to take this off and put this on. It's not a matter of I should and shouldn't. It's a matter of do you want peace? Because this is how you get it. You want to have a happy home? This is how you get it. Do you want to be right all the time? Then stay over there. Do you want to be the boss? Then stay over there. But if these are the things that you want, this is how you get them. And it's not a, it's no longer about how well I can do those things. It's really for me, like, I'm looking at it from a new perspective of God wants me to live a full life that I enjoy. And I'm miserable when I'm fighting. I'm miserable when I'm angry. I'm, do you know what a burden it is to carry unforgiveness? It's hard to enjoy life when you're mad at everybody. It's hard to love when you're full of hate. I've been there. I've been full of hate. It's hard to love. But you know what? In the midst of that, I don't lose my righteousness. I'm sorry, but I don't. Because it didn't come from me. It came from him. And my righteousness didn't come from you being wrong and me being right. My righteousness came from him and Christ alone. And I'm complete in him. And you can try to make me feel guilty all you want, but he owns me. He took the paperwork. You don't own it. No other principality owns it. No religion owns it. Nobody else owns that paperwork. Jesus took that paperwork, that handwriting of requirements, and he nailed it to the cross, and that's where it stays. Or you can take a different deal if you'd like. You can keep living a defeated life of Christianity where you feel guilt and shame all the time. Or you can walk in this newness of life. This is when Paul says, listen, if you receive Christ, walk in it. It's better. If you receive Christ, you should walk in it because it's a, it's a way better way of living life. You cannot do it, and you'll get to reap all of the terrible consequences that come with that.
to let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you were called into one body and be thankful. I love it because a little bit further down here he goes into wives submit to your own husbands as it is fitting to the Lord. And husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. When Paul says this, he's not saying, now wives, you have to submit to your husband. It's the law. And husbands, you got to love your wives and don't be bitter. We're kind of chuckling now because we're like, that's not what Paul said, but that's what we've been hearing. And, and so because that's what we hear when we don't submit and when we do get bitter, we feel instead of feeling like, hmm, I should change. We feel guilty and we don't change. Because when we feel guilty, we just get worse. And we carry these heavy burdens. And we don't know how to get rid of them. And these burdens get so heavy and it's like, oh, how do we get out of this thing? The way you get out of it is by renewing your mind. Because your mind's the thing that's jacked up in your life. Your perspective is the thing that's jacked up in your life. you got to renew your mind to go, oh, wait a minute, I've got a better deal than this. Nope, I'm not doing this. Let me get out of this. I receive grace, and all of my righteousness comes from Him, and none of it comes from me. And so my righteousness doesn't come because I was able to submit, or I was able to uh, uh, not be bitter towards my wife. I don't get accomplishments from heaven. God doesn't go, man... Man, you did a great job submitting to your husband. Instead, what God does when you submit to your husband, it goes, here's a better life. Here's some better results for you. I'm not going to spend another day trying to earn what God's already given me. I'm not going to do it. Sorry, as much as other people want me to, I'm not going to spend another day trying to earn what God has freely given to me. I'm just going to walk in it. And when I fail, and I will, and I'm going to take that off and put on the new. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Your word is perfect, it is precious, and it is pure, and there is nothing like it on the planet, and yet it is nonsense to us without your spirit. And so we thank you for the Holy Spirit that opens our eyes, illuminates our hearts, allows us to see in the mirror, to see our reflection, to see way past our skin, to see way into the depths of our heart and our soul. God, I thank you. I thank you for that reflection so that we can change and become what you've called us to be and so that we can live life and live life to its fullest. God, we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I have one more uh, uh, treat before we get to our uh, communion. We do the Lord's Supper together every week, not out of tradition, but because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, and there's so much richness that comes in remembering that. Amen. And it's also one of those things that really helps us uh, to be able to experience joy and to remember hurt at the same time. Amen. So before we do that, though, we have another uh, song from the daddy-daughter duo. Testing. Testing. Um, <clears throat> this song here is really a prayer that I wrote down, and uh, it ties in with exactly what we heard. You know, I'm reminded Jesus said, if you abide in me, you know, that's really all we have to do. And this is something I pray often.